Right, hello. Um, greetings. This is uh, Dr. Thomas Daffern again for my um, weekly talk, really, about, uh, you know, the state of the world, Brexit, <laughs> philosophy, metaphysics. I'm looking at contemporary politics through a sort of mes metaphysical lens, as, as uh, those of you that have listened before will know. And if you're new to my talks, then welcome. I'm going to start with a moment uh, of reflection. Uh, Tibetan Tantric style. Yes, so I want to start by referencing um, a few saints and sages. As you know, every day <clears throat> of the year I work through a universal calendar of saints and sages that I've authored when I was working as a religious studies teacher I was given the idea you can buy lots of calendars of Christian saints but to find ones with all the saints in Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, Islamic, pagan, Druid etc you can't, Taoist, Confucian, no so I produced it uh, because I run a centre for peace studies and global philosophy it's the only one of its kind I'm the guy that's got the duty of celebrating all the traditions and, and teasing out and bringing out the best of them. My job as an intellectual and philosopher is to find the best bits of all the philosophical heritage of humanity and, and somehow get us all seen together from the same hymn sheet, be you Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, Jewish, whatever. I worked at senior level as an interfaith leader in Britain and around the world, went to loads of conferences. I wrote this up for my PhD thesis um, in during the early 2000s <clears throat> and of course when 2001 happened the tragic events in America um, that you know that was the example of what's what not to do whoever was responsible and I've written a book about that you know obviously it was a breakdown of interfaith peacemaking given that I'd been to New York and, and sp spoken at the UN headquarters there that I knew interfaith leaders at a very senior level it was a, to me I took it as a personal tragedy that 2001 ever happened and that's why I'm determined to get to the bottom of who was actually responsible because it okay it was some you know low-level Muslim conspirators but they were sure as hell being manipulated and ruled by other people higher up the food chain and all the evidence points to the fact that the buildings are brought down through um, inside wiring <clears throat> as the Truth Commission um, you know has find, found out um, and I'm calling for an International Historical Commission of Inquiry into that. Um, <clears throat> published a book about that. So, yes, but um, my main focus is on peace and on how we can improve dialogue, spirituality and intellectual reconciliation between the <clears throat> academics and intellectuals of the different philosophical and religious systems. And uh, today and yesterday we've been celebrating number as we do every day of the year. I just want to focus on two because this has bearing on Brexit and on um, the tragedy really that is affecting my country, my beloved United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland which I'm a citizen of and who I'm appealing to with these broadcasts to, to come to your senses and have a second referendum, vote this time to remain inside the European Union and let's work together to make the European continent and union a better place of course it's not perfect and of course there are things that need improving but let's work together on this because the alternative is absolutely stark is the breakup of the united kingdom now <clears throat> and, i mean scotland is going to leave the united kingdom because of the rudeness of these tory brexiteers theresa may and now boris johnson uh, unbelievable arrogance hubris it's called in greek philosophy arrogance sheer arrogance you know, Boris Johnson should stick a placard on his neck and say, I'm sorry for Brexit, I've got it wrong, and walk all the way to um, to the Scottish border, you know, up the M6. <laughs> and and even that wouldn't make amends. I mean, the man is, the man is a, a, a cad and a bounder <laughs> um, of unbelievable rudeness. And, and so is Theresa May. Theresa May should join that walk. They should have a placard each, and Cameron and plead with the Scots not to leave the UK. I don't think it would work, even if they did. 
But, of course, they're not going to because they haven't got the moral intelligence to realise that's what's called for. Uh, I, I, I only feel so strongly about the Scottish thing because I lived in Scotland for seven years. I lived and worked and, and you know, mused in Scotland. And I, I understand the world from the Scottish perspective. Uh, most of my friends were some kind of Scottish nationalist or campaign of Scottish independence, which I did not understand at the time. It was a real learning curve for me for seven years. I'm going to come back to that point at the end of this talk. Um, I want to start by referencing some very interesting people yesterday. Yesterday was the Saints' Day of, um, firstly for women, Sophia, the Electress of Hanover, who lived from 1630 to 1714. Now, an amazing woman. Look, look her up on the internet. Look at her paintings that were done. One of them is by her sister. She was a gorgeous woman. She's got the same name as my daughter, my middle daughter, Sophia. Um, and we're planning a book of Sophia's one day to balance my book of Thomas's. Uh, very many interesting women called Sophia. She's one of them. Um, and she was um, <clears throat> the daughter of uh, Elizabeth, who was herself the daughter of King James, the first king of, of Great Britain, United King of Great Britain, effectively. Um, and James was the founder of the Jacobite dynasty. Now, so through his daughter, Elizabeth, who married the Winter King, who became briefly the Holy Roman Emperor, who was a Protestant, um, fell from grace, and um, Elizabeth, his daughter, and um, <clears throat> Frederick had to flee. Where did they go? Well, they went where anybody with any intelligence goes. They went to Holland, <laughs> because it was taking in refugees, you know, and so they ended up living in The Hague, which is now where the International Court of Justice is. And they had a great court there. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, and so baby Sophia was born in The Hague and brought up there. It's The Hague is actually where, where we're going to be holding our International Commission for Historical Inquiry into 9-11 uh, annually on 9-11 each year. So you know, if you're interested, come to The Hague. And if you're a historian, a qualified historian, then please come along. And we're going to go into it in detail. The Dutch are highly intelligent people. They're not fools. They stayed out of World War I, for instance. Very clever people. But they're now in the European Union, and they love it. Let's stay in it too. <laughs> anyway, this, this amazing woman, Sophia, then married um, a German aristocrat called Ernst Augustus who eventually became the Elector of Hanover, which gave him quite a lot of power and status. He became the, like a member of the court that ran the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and, you know, he was a flawed man. He, he uh, <clears throat> you know, wasn't, wasn't, um, he wasn't uh, the greatest of, of um, people, but he was a good man. And together they created um, their son, who was King George I of Great Britain and Hanover. Now, my reason for sharing this is Sophia was an intellectual. She was a friend of Leibniz. So, hang on, she's a British uh, intellectual, ends up in Europe, becomes briefly wife to the Holy Roman Emperor, you know, has an amazing court at Heidelberg where the Rosicrucians manifestos are written with unbelievable intellectuals passing by. They were you know, inspired by John Dee and the whole Rosicrucian tradition of pan-sophism, as it's called, and also um, the ideals of Francis Bacon, the ideas of science and so on. Bacon had dedicated the advancement of learning to um, Elizabeth's father, James VI, or James I of Great Britain. And, you know, this woman was highly intellectual, and her correspondence to Leibniz has been published recently, discovered. She read Spinoza, she read Descartes, she was friends with most of the intellectuals of Europe. She was personal friends not only with Leibniz, but also John Toland, who was a great Irish polymathic Druid Christian like me, who was one of the first intellectuals to really, you know, in depth write and talk about Druidry, by which he meant a sort of polymathic Universal respect for wisdom and learning. That's all that a druid is. It's someone that loves knowledge so much they're constantly finding more out and they love it so much and then they want to put it at the benefit of humanity. 
A druid is simply a true scholar, a true sage who, who loves learning so much they want to give it away. Because learning is like a candle flame. It, you can't hold on to it yourself. You have to hand it on. When I'm dead and gone, I hope you know people can have some of the, the, the light that has filled me. I've been given it by my teachers, my, my tutors, my some of them extraordinary people, you know, from all different lineages and traditions, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Druid, universalists, all of them. And and any wisdom I have I've inherited. So dear old Sophia was the same. I love her. I never met her, at least not in this life. Um friend of Leibniz, correspondent of all the great intellectuals of her day, and she was the mother of King George I, of Hanover, right? Um, who then, after all kinds of turmoil and trouble, is invited to become the King of England and Great Britain, without renouncing Hanover, it stays part of the same crown. So he's of Jacobite descent. Now he lands up in London, becoming king, has a coronation. And of course, unfortunately, the Jacobites didn't like him. And so they remained faithful to, to, um, to their version of the lineage. They said, no, that's the Jacobite heritage. The tragedy of all this is, of course, he was himself a Jacobite monarch, George I. And if only there'd been someone of the stature of, I don't know, Leibniz, still alive in London... They might have pointed this out and organised a mediation between the Jacobites who kept rebelling up in Scotland and the Hanoverians who kept sending armies up. You know, the whole thing was a mistake. <laughs> they should have just sat down and, and dedicated their lives to true learning and true scholarship, like Leibniz had done and John Tolan and Spinoza and Descartes. This is why I run Philosophers for Peace, because there may not be that many of us, but we are actually quite influential. I respect deeply, therefore, Sophia of Hanover. She died finally in 1714 before she ever got to, um, you know, trot along in the wake of George I. She died in Hanover, um, got, got caught a chill, but she was in her 80s, which in those days was a big innings. She was also the mother of another Sophia, who I also greatly love, <coughs> called Sophia Charlotte, 1668-1705, two of my favourite girls' names. And this Sophia um, was married off to the, uh, <coughs> the king of Prussia. And she did in Berlin exactly what her mother had done in Hanover. She turned Berlin into an intellectual powerhouse. And she founded the Prussian Academy of Sciences with Leibniz as her friend and correspondent, just as he was to her mother. And she brought together all the great you know, wits of of Berlin and Germany as it was developing into, and founded the Academy in Prussia, um, and also founded a great castle at Charlottenburg, which I've been to. If you're ever in Berlin, go to the castle. It's not a castle, it's more like a chateau. It's a beautiful, beautiful house called uh, Schloss Charlottenburg, and she lived there with her husband, um, and it's still, you know, it's now in, inside Berlin. In those days, it was kind of on the fringe. And she also knew John Toland. Um, <laughs> there's a wonderful story um, about Peter the Great, who we celebrated the day before here in the castle, uh, sorry, in the museum, on the 11th, on the 8th of November. Peter the Great, who was a, a Freemason and a mystic and a scientist, came to Europe to learn what he could about sciences and stuff. He wanted to take it back and modernise Russia and bring it up into scratch with other countries. And apparently he met both Sophia's. He had a private meeting with Sophia of Hanover, the mother, and Sophia Charlotte, the daughter. And he was so impressed by their intellectual brilliance, this, this mother and daughter team. He was apparently rendered speechless. <laughs> now that's Peter the Great, one of the cleverest rulers Russia's ever had, right? Kind of the Putin of his day. And he was rendered speechless by this, this dynamic duo from Hanover and Prussia. Um, one of whose children was now the King of England. Uh, I love that. That make a great scene in a play. Um, <clears throat> I also think that Peter the Great would be absolutely appalled <laughs> at the thought that Russia was tinkering and, in, and causing Brexit and buying corrupt Tories to kind of, you know, do their Brexit shenanigans. Um, Peter the Great was a man of integrity and he loved Western Europe. He loved Britain. He loved... 
Holland, he loved France, he loved Germany. You know, he, he was not a fool. He appreciated the brilliant achievements intellectually of Europe, Western Europe. And, you know, he wasn't going to misuse his, um, his uh, intelligence service to kind of, like, destroy these states. So I think that if Russia has been involved, if Putin has been a sort of naughty boy, and any of his cronies have, they really need to stop and back off because the Sophias are very angry uh, and very upset about that. Anyway, so those are two I want to celebrate. Um, I also want to celebrate this day um, a famous Catholic intellectual who uh, we celebrated um, yesterday on the 9th of November uh, called Gustav Gundlach. And today I want to celebrate um, yeah, another intellectual who we celebrated um, who was called, or is called, <clears throat> if I get the pronunciation right, Heinrich Pesch. Uh, let's do Heinrich first. He's today's saint. He's from 1854 to 1926. Now, he's not officially a saint. My book of saints and sages includes all the official saints, but also others. So he's an extra. Heinrich Pesch um, was a Jesuit who lived from 1854 to 1926, and he was um, <clears throat> important because he was one of the forerunners of Catholic social thought and economic thought um, and influential in the whole intellectual world which has made the European Union possible. Let me explain what I mean. So at the time when Pesch was joining the Jesuits and becoming a professor and an intellectual, Europe was riven into all kinds of tensions and conflicts and Marx had done his writings and said there's going to be an eternal struggle between the poor working class who are going to be in constant revolution against the rich until they win and take over and um, you know and there was also the conservatives saying no 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 we'll keep it all as it is thank you and then there were the laissez-faire capitalists saying you know the state shouldn't have anything to do with helping the poor um, you know let them die it's all God's invisible hand uh, you know, Tory justification for social brutality, then as now, was, well, I know there's a lot of homes on the street, but, you know, hey, it's going to get better after 20 years. You know, we'll do Brexit, and then, well, they'll either die out or, uh, you know, they'll get a job, you know. <clears throat> that sort of laissez-faire Toryism was then active. Well, these this Catholic intellectual did a huge study of all the economic theories at the time. He called it Lehrbuch der national economy uh, the you know the study of <clears throat> um, national economic systems and he itemized he said look there's that extreme liberalism that laissez-faire thing there's that extreme state kind of let's let's take over and control everything communist theory and he said no there's got to be a middle way the true christian doctrine surely has got to be that Yes, we want to encourage individual growth, individual wealth, entrepreneurship, etc. But we mustn't forget our solidarity for the poor. We mustn't forget our, um, our duties to the poor. We have spiritual duties. And if we want an economic system based on love, which as a Christian is what he wanted, because he rightly said Christ came to teach love, not violence, hatred and aggression and class war. No, Christ came to bring a society based on love, we know that Christ himself from the Gospels had friends who were rich and friends who were poor. You know, in all, and friends somewhere in the middle. Um, <clears throat> his parents were not that rich because when they go to Bethlehem, it says in the Gospels, they were too poor to stay at the inn. That's what Luke says. Um, which is why they end up just affording the stables. So... <clears throat> But I think his parents are rich culturally and intellectually, and that's another form of richness, which, whereas some money-rich people are very stupid, extremely stupid. One thinks of Donald Trump, you know. Sorry, mate, I'll come back to you in a minute. <laughs> um, anyway, Pesh saw all this, and he proposed in his book this theory that Christian economics should not follow the Marxist route of inevitable class conflict and war till the crack of doom when the poor take over in a revolution, uh, nor should it follow the kind of laissez-faire extreme right-wing Toryism of to hell with everyone, let them all die, let's go on being rich, you know, the sort of Eton, Boris Johnson ideology of 
the, the cabinet cronies around Johnson are, are just classic kind of pesh material for the extremists he was opposing. He said, no, let's have a middle way based on love and let's call it, let's, let's coin a word, you know, like me, he was a wordsmith. He invented a word in German, solidarismus, meaning solidarity. What we need is, is to have solidarity between the classes based on love. So the rich... People like Sophia Charlotte and, and Sophia of Hanover, you know, they were wealthy, rich, but they didn't neglect the poor. They didn't neglect the, the young scholars that came knocking at the door and said, look, hey, I'm John Toland. I haven't got a bean, but hey, I'm a great Druid, you know. Come in, John, let's talk about Druidry, shall we? No, that's, that's the duty of the rich to the poor. And also the poor have a duty to, of solidarity to... to to do their best, to try and do something creative with their lives, not just sort of sit around waiting for, for a handout, but to do something, you know, creative. There's, however poor we are, we can always do something with our days. And so that was the idea of solidarismus. And this idea was revolution. I mean, actually, when you think about it, it's total common sense. Of course, that's what is the middle way. That's what Aristotle would say is the virtue, the mean between these extremes. And that became mainstream Catholic social thinking. Um, he influenced then the Pope, who was called Pope Poet Pius XI at the time, um, who a few years after his death, he died in 1926, old Pesh, but the Pope had been mulling it away. And in 1931, he issued a revolutionary document called <coughs> Quadragesimo Anno meaning in my 40th year, it was the 40th year I think he'd been around, and it's, it's a summary, a masterly summary in Latin, which has been translated obviously into English, of Catholic social teaching. And to read it now is, is still revelatory. I mean, it's amazing. Go and read it. Because he says exactly what I've said about Pesh, that the, the church should, should have care for all classes, however, you know, situated in the wealth-poverty axis. The duty of love from the universal church is to all. Christ doesn't say when you come into heaven, like, you know, what's your bank balance? Have you got, are you in credit or debit? You know, no. Um, it's what you've done with what you had. So if you've been rich, have you given it to worthy causes? Have you helped poor people? Have you helped advance the kingdom of God on earth? Uh, which is the Christian idea of a society transformed by love, so that we become a society where the tears are dried up. You know, it's there in the great Isaiah prophetic vision of a, a world of peace. Now, that's what Christ himself inherited. Christ was inspired by Isaiah and Enoch and all the other great prophets and sages. Not to build just a sort of little enclave of chosen peopleness um, hiding behind a wall, but a, a a globe transformed into a place of peace and social justice. That's the universal vision that Christ had got. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, listen to my um, commentaries on the Gospels. To I go into fine detail on every aspect of that. But the fundamental prayer of the Christians is, let thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. There's no point just if you're a Christian saying, well, it's fine, I'm going to go to heaven, like Calvinists sometimes are misinterpreted as saying. Uh, this idea of predestination, well, you know, I'm chosen, sorry about you, but you can't come. That's such a stupid idea, and totally against the Christian ethos. It's like, let's transform this whole planet into the kingdom of God, into the Shambhala realm. That was Christ's actual work. And dear old Pesh and Pope Pius XI realised that. So they wrote it, they did their homework, and they wrote up this amazing tract it's called an encyclical, meaning it has authority. It still, today, stands at the basis of Catholic social and economic teaching. And it's, you know, it's, it's the best of the socialist ideals of corporatism and help and mutual solidarity, plus the best of, let's say, liberalism, the idea of individual genius and entrepreneurship. And also important is... is the state shouldn't have absolute control over everything you do and say and think. Um, <clears throat> it shouldn't be a state-run economy, but rather a state-enabling economy so that your family, your, your partnerships, your companies can have autonomous, legally protected uh, you know, identity 
Um, businesses shouldn't be persecuted, but on the other hand, they shouldn't control and dominate. And as Marion Williamson has said, that's the problem with American corporate capitalism. It's now gone so far in the direction of corporate capitalist um, control that it's almost like a state control, but flipped, and it's become capitalist corporate control. So we get people like Trump who represent that corporatism, which um, this encyclical by the church is totally opposed to. Anyway, um, <clears throat> and this, of course, was issued in 1931 at a time when the world was polarising into fascism versus communism. And the poor old church was saying, hang on, please stop fighting, there's got to be a middle way. Okay, so that uh, also, the next guy I want to celebrate today, Gustav Gundlach, was the successor of Pesch. He lived from 1892 to 1958. Now, he also became a Jesuit. He was extremely clever, a great scholar and philosopher and all that. Studied with Pesch, I think he met him, <coughs> and certainly studied his ideas, and then it developed them even further. And he devoted his life to the sketching out in depth of this concept of solidarismus, that, that how can we show solidarity to each other in, in a society, irrespective of our wealth and status and power? How can we build a society based on love? As a Jesuit, he was sworn to advance the kingdom of God on earth through only through reason, demonstration, like Ignatius of Loyola, you, you know, through, through study and scholarship. <clears throat> and that's what he devoted himself to. And then he, um, he taught in Germany. He then was headhunted. He had to go to the Gregorian University in Rome. He taught in Rome. And he became close friends with Pope Pius XII, who'd taken over as Pope after the death of Pope Leo XI. And Pius XII, who was himself a very clever man, continued this, this tradition, um, <clears throat> which is... And he was in despair at World War II and the tragedy of this fascist versus communist battle that was raging um, and the extremism. Uh, old, old Gundlach wrote and taught against the fascist traditions in Germany and Austria. He was German. He castigated personally the Bishop of Vienna, who was there shaking hands with Hitler when Hitler did his, um, you know, union of the two nations. Um, and Gundlach said, no, this is not Catholic teaching, this fascism. This is racism. And he wrote a tract against racism as a Catholic. He said, hang on, the church is about universal dignity of all human beings, universal human rights. Not about one race is better than another. That's, that's anti-Christian. So he was absolutely in no two minds about the status of Nazism and fascism as, as heresies, effectively. But poor old Pius XII, who was one of his close mates, <clears throat> he's now a professor at the Gregorian University in Little Rome, the Vatican City, and the Pope knows that if they preach you know, too strongly against the fascists who are running the country by now, they'll be arrested in Catholic um, churches all over Europe will be sort of bombed and they'll do a crystal knack to all the churches. So, so what he decided to do was make a, <clears throat> a sort of intellectual protest, um, do all that he could to, to mitigate the worst effects of Nazism and fascism. And Gundlach was his right-hand man in all that, okay? Um, <clears throat> and intellectually was, was clear as a bell. Um, but also they were very suspicious of the extremes that Stalin was going to. They were in no naive kind of, let's all cheer for Russia, they're, they're the great white hope, which some left-leaning intellectuals in Britain had, had thought that, yeah, because we hate the Nazis, so we love Stalin. Well, no, it doesn't work like that intellectually. Stalin was doing atrocious things. I mean, he'd even been oppressing his own troops and his own generals before the war. He'd been persecuting anyone that spoke out against him, not least, of course, the church. And when I read Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, you know, it was like an eye-opener for me. And if you haven't read it, go off and read it. If you haven't read the book, The Black Book of Communism, go off and read it. Realise what was done in the name of this extreme state socialism, which masqueraded as the good, and yet, <clears throat> as always, you know, diabolically takes on the pretense of being good, but actually does evil. So these people knew that. Um, and so they had to 
tread a very dangerous line, not to offend uh, anyone, but somehow to make plain that the Catholic Church taught a different path, which was the path of love. Now, love, in the views of an extreme communist or an extreme Nazi, is an embarrassment. They're not interested. The extreme communist, the, the dedicated Marxist, is a materialist. There's no such thing as love. There may be chemical atoms flying about when you have sex, that's it. There's no soul love for them because the soul doesn't exist. For Nazis and fascists, love doesn't exist because, well, it's determined by your race. You know, you'll love your own race, but you can't love the other race. So like apartheid, you can't fall in love with a black woman because she's another race. Or you can't fall in love with a Jewish woman, even though Heidegger did with Hannah Arendt. No, because she's Jewish. So actually, Nazism and fascism are anti-love. The church knew this, and Gunlach knew this, and so they continued in, almost in secret, to develop their, their real teachings about the church for when they could bring it out at the end of World War II, when these madmen had been killing you know, and fighting. Um, <clears throat> and I think they cheered a great sigh of relief when, when the Allies won, because at least we had left in our culture a space for love to flourish. You know, and, and the Church of England had helped Montgomery's victory in El Alamein and, and uh, St Paul's had survived the Blitz. My parents met in the Blitz. They were both Anglicans. They, they had enough of that understanding of what love is to raise our family with that sense, that sense of, of love that, for me, all true civilization comes from and which the church teaches, whether it's Anglican, Catholic or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's, it's one universal church and, and these people knew that. So what Gundlach did after the war was very clever. He developed the idea of sub, um, solidarismus into a new kind of development, which he called <clears throat> the idea of subsidiaryness, um which was a slight evolution of the idea. And that each level of society should, should function as best it can within that, that level of its competence. And that the upper levels don't have the right to then lord it over them and tell them what to do. So no Stalinist kind of, or, or Nazi kind of thing, the Gauleiter coming and checking up, you know, am I teaching the right thing? If not, I'm, I'm for the camp to be liquidated. <laughs> no, it's my intellect as a teacher. I know what I'm teaching. I know, you know, I'm trying to share some light here. So it's up to me to order my own teaching work. Um, and that was what Gunlach said. So this idea is actually what infused the ideas of the European Union, the idea that the Union doesn't have the right to interfere in local things. Um, it's been lost sight of a bit, and that's, um, you know, it needs to be remembered. But what's so important is that when the European Union was founded, the first step was the Treaty of Rome in 1957. It was the flourishing, in many ways, of Gundlach's ideas and this whole tradition of social, Catholic, economic thought, which was a middle way between the extremes of, of Soviet communism or laissez-faire American capitalism, both of which they saw as, as wrong. In American capitalism, extreme capitalism, dog-eat-dog, -dog, the rich are fine, they flourish, there's no solidarity net, there's nothing for the poor. Few handouts, but humiliation, poverty, and skid row. They saw that in the Depression. And European intellectuals like Gundlach were horrified. Is that what capitalism stands for? Well, then we don't want that. That's not Christian. Likewise with the Soviet Union. What is this? Sending people to camp, making them work to death in 40 below freezing in Siberia where they all die? That's not Christianity. That's not love. So the thinking that went into the formation of the European Union to create a safe space where we can show solidarity across the classes and, and also we can encourage the individual genius